Paul was a preacher. He was a preacher of preachers, you might say. He didn't care who said what he shouldn't preach. He didn't listen to them. He didn't care what they said about his preaching. He just preached the gospel. And, and his goal was to honor Jesus Christ and to exalt him. In Acts, in his address to the elders um, at Ephesus, he was so sure of himself in his complete preaching of the gospel that he said to them on his departure, he said, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. It's interesting because sometimes preachers get stuck in a rut. It's easy enough to do. I remember a preacher one time who would start a sermon and he'd start on a different subject every time, but he'd always end up on his pet subject by the time the sermon was done. And I mean, it's not that hard to do. If you've preached much at all, you'd know it's not that hard to do. It takes planning and effort to preach the whole counsel of God. And so this past week or two, two weeks maybe now, Brock kind of reminded me of that when he brought up the subject um, that we don't hear preached on much in the church. In fact, I can count on one hand the number of times that I've heard it preached. And so we're going to look at that this morning. If I asked you, I, it'd be curious to know your answer. If I asked you what Moses the lawgiver, what David the king of kings, well, the, in, in the Jewish terms, the king that everyone looked to as the example of a king, Elijah the prophet, Queen Esther, Daniel the prophet, Anna the prophetess, the Apostle Paul and Jesus Christ all had in common. It'd be interesting to know what your answer would be. I realize there's probably more than one thing that they have in common. I mean, they had God in common for sure. They had faith in God in common for sure. Um, so there's a number of things that they had in common. But I'm thinking of one thing in particular this morning. And I, I'm guessing that most people wouldn't think of it. We also get stuck in ruts and we forget things and it, that's why it's good to read the Word of God on a daily basis because we come across these things and we go, oh, I forgot all about that. You know, remember, in our society we don't worry too much about being comfortable. We're pretty comfortable. In China, Yukon was telling us that where her husband comes from, they don't have any heat. So when it gets down to zero or sometimes a little bit below zero Fahrenheit or Celsius, I guess. No, Celsius, sorry. It gets pretty cold now. So you keep your coat on and your all your clothes when you sleep and everything. And so that's not too comfortable. Some places in the world, um, they think that the way we have food is just outrageous because they don't have the food we have. They don't have the supply of food that you and I have. In fact, there are people that are starving to death in this world still. You think about that. It's kind of awful considering where we live and what we have. And it's probably because of that that we don't find it commonplace for Christians in our society, society to be practicing the discipline of fasting. In fact... You rarely hear people talk about that in our society. You rarely hear people talk about it in the church. But fasting has always been synonymous with God and his people ever since creation. It's been there. And there's a reason why. And so I want us to look at what fasting is today and why we should fast. Why, why we do that. In large part today, the fasting's become a practice of medicine. The, the people that deal with medicine have recorded that this practice of fasting for healing the body has been for however long things have been around, they say. 
It might be for obesity or arthritis or any kind of disease. In fact, some people in the medical field will say that fasting is the one medical thing that can help heal most any kind of thing that you're having trouble with with your body. Now, I don't know if I buy into all of that, but they say that. That's what the medical profession is saying. I find it interesting that it's so popular among the medical profession when in large part they deny God and they deny his existence and he's the one that put it into practice. It's kind of interesting. I'm not saying that everybody in the medical field does, but a lot of people do. The scripture teaches us that fasting is the abstaining of food for spiritual purposes. It is not a hunger strike. It is not a diet plan. Because those things have no holy or spiritual purpose. It most always involved the abstaining of solid foods and liquids with the exemption of water. In Luke chapter 4 and verse 2, Luke describes Jesus' fast to us. He says he went out and he fasted for 40 days. He ate nothing. He just ate nothing. And in the, at the end of the 40 days, he was hungry. You think if you went without food for 40 days, you might be hungry? <laughs> I think I might be hungry long before 40 days came around. But it's more than just abstaining from food. Some people think it's just abstaining from food. But if you look in scripture, prayer is always mentioned along with fasting. And there's a reason for that. Because fasting is the abstaining from foods, but with the idea of turning your complete attention and focus on God and his will. It's redirecting your focus. So what I'm saying is that fasting is a denial of physical things, and it doesn't just have to be food. It can be other things that you deny yourself for, God's, for focusing on God. But it's a denying of earthly things to put our attention on God and what his will is for our life. Saying he is more important than anything else in this life for you. That's what you're saying. Now, it can be done in various ways. Esther is asked by Mordecai to go and do something that would cost her her life. She was, in, she was in the king's palace, but no one went to the king unless the king requested them to come. If they just went into the presence of the king without his request, he'd kill them. It was that simple. And Mordecai says, you got to go to the king. And she says, but that's going to cost my life. And uh, she, he says, yeah, I know. But he says, your life's on the line anyways. Because if they kill all the Jews like they're talking about annihilating the Jews, you're a Jew. Don't forget that. And she said, okay. So in chapter 4 and verse 16 of Esther, she says, hold, hold a fast on my behalf. Don't eat or drink for three days. And she's not saying fast to her. She's saying fast to God, but because of her situation. And she said, I'll go to the king, and if I perish, I perish. You know, that's faith. That's like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They said, chuck us in there. If we die, well, or if, we, if he saves us, he saves us. He's God. And if we die, he's still God. It doesn't matter. And so she had that kind of faith. And of course, the rest of the story is that the Jews were delivered. The king listened to her and, and all of that. In Daniel chapter 9, Daniel fasts and prays for the nation because they're in captivity. And it doesn't tell us the specifics of that fast. But then in chapter 10, he's fasting again. And this time, he's mourning and all it says is that he abstained from delicacies, from meat and wine. So we can gather from this that fasting may consist of abstaining from everything and anything except water. Or it can be, I guess you'd call it a conditional fast. Where you abstain from certain things. Maybe the things 
that are your that have their claws in you and are distracting you from God. If you abstain from those things to get a clearer focus on God. But it's really interesting when you get to the New Testament and you see what Jesus says about fasting. In Matthew chapter 6 and in verses 16 to 18 is recorded just three verses of Jesus talking about fasting. And the very first thing he says in verse 16, he says, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, you have they have received a reward. So he says the first thing you need to understand is it's not about uh, uh, being a show. It's not something that you put on display. It's not something that you go looking for people to say, oh, wow, they're really fasting. They're really, they're really um, spiritual people. That's not what it's about. It's not to put on a show. It's supposed to be a benefit for the person, between the person and the Lord. That's what fasting's about. In fact, he says exactly the opposite. He says, anoint your head, wash your face when you fast. The point is, He's saying, refresh yourself. Yeah, if you're fasting, you may look, um, you may run out of energy a little bit, but he's saying, refresh yourself and, and, and do it in a cheerful way. That's what the Lord wants. You're not, it's not to show people, don't do it with a gloomy attitude, but do it with a cheerful attitude. And the other thing that we get from this is it's not a way to get God to do you a favor. I think sometimes people think when they fast that God has to do what they want them to do. And, and that's not seen in fasting in the scripture. It's not so God does you a favor, although there will be a reward in it if you have the right attitude and you're fasting for the right reasons. And it's not for the purpose of punishing or harming the body as a di disciplinary action. So Jesus says, those aren't the things that it is, but what is it? Fasting is something that is personal between you and the Lord. It can also be something that is done as an entire church body. We can all fast together for, for whatever thing that is needed. The nation fasted together when they were caught in sin and God was going to discipline them for their sin. They fasted together. In Acts chapter 13 and 14, Paul they're sending Paul and Silas out, or Paul and Barnabas out. And so the church fasted. They laid their hands on them and sent them out on a mission. And so it can be done as a community thing or it can be done individually. In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus, when he's asked um, why his disciples aren't fasting, he says, um, well, let's see, John's disciples were fasting, and so they were, the Pharisees were asking why not. Well, their hidden agenda was that they had commanded a fast. And Jesus says, why would they fast when the bridegroom's here? When the bridegroom is taken from them, they will fast. And so we understand that the disciples of Jesus in those days would be fasting eventually. It just they weren't fasting because it was a celebratory time. They were celebrating that they were with the bridegroom. There would be a time when the bridegroom would be taken away and fasting would be necessary, would be a necessary discipline for them. So fasting is not so much about celebrating as being something that is more of a discipline to keep you in focus, to keep you in a good relationship, in a right relationship with God. And again, it's abstaining from food, focusing on God. Um, it's kind of like when Jesus went to the, and talked to the Samaritan woman at the well He's talking to her and, and the disciples had gone in and bought some food for him to come out and they go, they come out and he's like ignoring them and talking to the woman and they're like, 
I wonder, did someone already, maybe she brought him food. Maybe someone brought him food or something. He's not hungry anymore. And Jesus said, no, my food is to do the will of God. Sometimes God's will is more important than filling our tummies. And, and Jesus had that focus. He would forgo the comforts and necessities of this life for a time if it meant getting a soul in the kingdom of God. Now, over the years I've talked to people about fasting and they say, well, Christians are never commanded to fast. Jesus never said, thou shalt fast. And they're right. They're absolutely right. But I would say it seems like in Scripture that fasting, according to Jesus, was as much a part of the fabric of Christianity as the Lord's Supper and repentance and confession and all of those things. In Matthew 16, or 6 and 16, he, Jesus said, and when you fast. He didn't say, and if you fast, or if you choose sometime to fast. He talks like he had an expectation that they would fast. He says, and when you fast, this is how you do things. This is the process you do, or this is how it should be done. Now, we've already seen in Matthew that he said his disciples would be fasting when he was taken away from them. And the last time I checked, you and I are disciples of Jesus Christ, are we not? We belong to him. We're following him. That's what a disciple does. So he didn't say, thou shalt fast, but he certainly expected that his disciples would fast. And in saying that, he has upheld the discipline of fasting for God's people, for the church, for Christians, however you want to put it. It should be part of our life. So that leads us to the question then that many people have asked. What is the purpose of fasting? When Israel was in captivity, because they had forsaken God's covenant for their own lusts and desires, um, and they were doing that because they were abusing each other and taking things from each other, and, and they brought this judgment on themselves. But they were in captivity. And in Zechariah chapter 7, it, we re if you read through that passage, you will see that they had certain times that they fasted. It was required that everyone fasted on the five, fifth month and the seventh month. They would have a fast. And the people are inquiring of God if they should still do that fast. It's interesting. God tells Zechariah, he says, go ask the people. When you fast, fasted in the fifth and seventh months, was it for me that you fasted? Was it because you were humbled before me? Or is it simply for you to get something? That's what he's asking them. Are you fasting because you want to get out of captivity? Or are you fasting because you are remorseful for the sin in your life and what put you in this position in the first place? And there's a difference between those two. Yes, they didn't want to be in captivity, but their attitude should have been, we're fasting because we are so sorry, Lord, that we went against you and that we did not honor you. But I think their fasting was because they wanted to get out of captivity. And there's a difference. And so he says, was your fasting for me? See, fasting isn't, isn't something that we go do when we want something from God. Fasting we do when we humble ourselves before God because we realize our position with Him and His position in our life and we want to keep that right. And we want, if we've done something wrong, we want to get that right. Remember when uh, Jonah went to Nineveh and they, Nineveh all repented and they fasted? It wasn't because they, they wanted some favor from God. It was because they had sinned that they were fasting. 
So it's not for personal benefits, although done with the right attitude, God does reward his people. But you don't do it for the reward, you do it for God. When David had that child with Bathsheba, why did David fast as long as that child was alive? Why did David not eat? Because the prophet had told him that the child was going to die, and David didn't want that child to die to pay for his sin. He didn't want, he went to God and he fasted because of his sin. Yes, he wanted that child to live because he didn't want that child to pay the penalty for his sin. He realized he had sinned and he was pleading with God that it was on him, not on the little child. And so we, we fast because we want to be right with God. Fasting also reminds us of who sustains us. I like my food, and like most people do, um, doctors, dietitians, they'll tell you how to eat healthy and what will give you longevity in life. And there are so many things out there telling us different things, and some of it's true. In the wilderness, God sustained the people for 40 years. Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 21. He sustained them. Not the food. Nothing else but God sustained them. When David is hemmed in by his enemies, he says, I lay down and sleep at night and I wake again because the Lord sustains me. Psalm 3 and verse 5. You see, we fast because it isn't the food that sustains us. It's God that sustains us. Yes, we have to eat. I understand that. God understands that. We know all of that. But if we don't put the spiritual ahead of the physical, then we don't have things in proper alignment and we don't have God sustaining us. And so fasting is an abstaining from the physical things, the focus and the, the desire of physical things, for the desire of God's spiritual food and the desire of his will to be done. The purpose is to remove ourselves from the physical things of this world and intensely concentrate on God. You could put it this way. You hunger more after God and his spiritual sustenance than you hunger after the temporal, physical things. And in doing that, it brings balance to our lives. It puts the non-essentials of life in their place so they aren't controlling our lives. How many things do you have in your life that are consuming you and taking your time? Maybe you're taking your time away from God and his directives for your life. How often do we lust after the things we want but we don't need? You see, fasting turns that around. It helps us to get the natural desires of our human selves in check and in balance with the more important spiritual things. And that's what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, when he says, I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. That's what he's saying. He said, I gotta make sure I'm in proper in proper shape spiritually. So fasting is for the purpose of gaining spiritual clarity of thought, and it allows us to hear God and to see God more clearly in our lives. And it also demonstrates a profound need for God's help and guidance in our lives through complete surrender and dependence upon Him. So what can we conclude about fasting? Well, first of all, it seems to be a Christian discipline that we should practice. Jesus practiced that discipline, and as he did in all of his teachings, not only did he talk about it, but he lived it. And when he spoke about fasting, he didn't say the words, thou shalt, but he used a language that clearly states his expectation of his disciples. When you fast, he said, this is how you fast. Many people 
are looking for the easiest way to go as a Christian. And so they're looking to do as little as possible. Kind of like, have you met that person that just wants to meet the minimum requirements? Maybe if I can get away with a little of the requirements even, then I don't have to, I'll be even better off. The less I have to do, the better it is. Jesus makes it clear that as a Christian, fasting should be a discipline that should be part of our lives. And the result of fasting is beneficial for the person who practices it. It gives us a clear, undivided focus on God. It gets our priorities right in life. It puts our focus where it needs to be and where our dependence, it puts our dependence on where it needs to be. It is so easy in our world to depend on things because all we have to do is punch a number in our phone and someone delivers it to the door or we could just run to the store and get whatever we need. But we can't forget it's all there because God put it there. It's all because of God that it's there. And so fasting helps us to lead a life of humility and surrender, which is absolutely necessary in having a relationship with God. I hope that's helped you to understand the discipline of fasting a little bit. I also hope that it's encouraged you to use fasting as a means of having a stronger relationship with God. If we can serve you in any way this morning, we'd just ask that you let us know while we stand and sing. Jesus, I surrender all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender Ah! Uh-huh.